Welcome to To The Point Cybersecurity Podcast. Each week, join Audra Simons and Rachel Lyon to explore the latest in global cybersecurity news, trending topics, and industry transformation initiatives impacting governments, enterprises, and our way of life. Now, let's get to the point. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of To The Point Podcast. I'm Rachel Lyon. Here with my co-host Audra Simons. Hey, Rachel. hi, How you doing? Audra. You're in London. I'm well, but I'm not in London like you. I'm so jealous. Well, How well, is it? It's great, and I appreciate the fact you finally sent us our summer. So for the last, <laughs> the last week, we've been in the 80s and 90s, and and it's been the hottest day. I think was yesterday in the whole wow. year this year. So I appreciate the sunshine. So thank you. Wow. Awesome. Anything I could do to help sending it from Texas, I'm happy to deflect it all day long. Um, and so I'm so excited today for our guest. Um, you know, every every guest we have, I learned something new, and I absolutely know that that's going to happen today. Please welcome to the podcast, Dr. David Bader. He's a distinguished professor and founder of the Department of Data Science in the Ying Wu College of Computing and director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, he's a leading expert in solving global grand challenges in science, engineering, computing, and data science. Wow. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thanks, Rachel. Good to be here today with um, you and Andra. Looking forward to talking about cybersecurity. Excellent. Love it. So, All right, Audra. I know off? you got the first question yeah, today. Could we jump off? I'd really like to start by talking about how open source tools can support data analytics. And I know that you, you said on the side a little bit around how you can use some of the solutions to discover vulnerabilities in open source. So could you kick us off in that direction? Audra, thank you. So as you know, we've discovered in the last couple of years some major exploits dealing with open source software and libraries included in, in many packages. And this impacts our servers, it imp impacts our networks, even our printers. It's really, really scary to, to think about. And often the open source software is a uh, supply chain of, of software that we use in many applications, even in firmware on, on our devices. And it's very hard to detect malicious software being injected into the open source software. So within a single package, we're very good now as a community for having tools that can scan individual packages, but it's very, very hard to find exploits that may insert code across different packages where each piece of the code may not be that sensitive, but when brought all together and compiled together, linked together, then we find that we have a major exploit. We at New Jersey Institute of Technology in partnership with Accenture are working on tools and algorithms that are able to look at the open source supply chain of software and detect those vulnerabilities and be able to protect against those exploits. Very, very exciting project at hand. How, how are you actually linking up across multiple packages to actually be able to work out when something that looks harmless becomes evil? <laughs> Great question. So we're focused on a major source of open source software, namely GitHub and looking at tens of thousands of open source packages that are used in everyday applications, commercial and business applications, and some of the, the most impactful projects that are often used by industry. And we're ingesting those packages and multiple versions of those packages and building a graph connections of lines of software between those packages and using the most sophisticated graph analytics at scale to detect those vulnerabilities. Now, I think this is amazing because I think the problem is we tend to look at what's obvious and it's like, oh, well, if we're using this and it's, you know, package by package, that's where we're safe. And the fact that we're actually then finding where people are getting smart enough to put different bits of code across different packages that makes a huge difference to be able to identify that. 
That, that's right. And it's very hard to discover because it may be embedded in different versions of different libraries and packages. And by building a graph, and a graph is a very simple data structure where maybe vertices in the graph represent lines of source code in different packages and edges represent connections between those lines of source code and other packages, maybe where those subroutines are, are called. And by building this massive graph, we're able to discover those connections and those linkages that may be like finding a needle in a haystack with, without this type of, of tool. Exactly. The only question is, where are you getting your actual test data from? Because when you want to find a needle in a haystack, you need to know what the needle might look like. <laughs> That's correct. Well, we have decades worth of experience building some of the largest graph analytics at scale for the enterprise to discover not just one needle in a haystack, but many needles in haystacks made of needles as well. <laughs> so we've been working on these types of problems for a very long time, building a lot of tools that, that have been transferred to industry and government. And we're able to create better algorithms with fidelity to be able to, to find those exploits. We already know of some in past, um, in, in the past few years, we've seen some of those exploits, so we can learn from those. But we're also expecting that we may have new exploits that we haven't seen before or have new ways. So we're looking for patterns, and graphs are an excellent way to find those patterns of the types of malicious code that we may expect to see in the future. So moving on, but still on the topic of open source. Um, how will open source technology impact the democratization of data? That's a great question, Audra, and I'm very passionate about democratizing data science tools so that anyone in any place on any system is able to perform the, uh, the really complicated calculations that normally only large enterprise could do. So we are building out tools, open source tools on GitHub that allow anyone with a Jupyter Notebook or running Python to be able to run their analytics as easily as they would toolkits like NumPy and Pandas or NetworkX, to, but to be able to manipulate tens to hundreds of terabytes, massive amounts of, of data on back-end supercomputers without having any knowledge or rogue programming skills to program a supercomputer or understand how to interface and get access to those systems. So we're trying to make data science accessible and provide the tools so that anyone anywhere can run their cybersecurity problems and be able to ingest data sets logs and other information to protect themselves against cyber terrorists and cyber hacks. Excellent. Now, I think, I think the thing is we're learning from kind of a work perspective that ML and AI can come into our lives and help us be more efficient. And if you're actually starting to be able to make things more accessible to people who may be data scientists still, so they understand the methodologies and techniques to use it, but don't have access to the supercomputers and things like that, this, this is an amazing step forward. That's right. And as you see, learning large language models, for instance, ChatGPT, BARD, and others, requires millions of dollars in massive special purpose built supercomputers and proprietary libraries to be able to create those models. And what we would like to do is provide the tools so that the broad community can create their own models and not have to rely on uh, having a budget of millions of dollars and access to new processor technologies right. to be able to do the the same learning and the same capabilities. So we're really, really passionate about open source and the democratization of these types of tools. That's wonderful. So yeah. in terms of talking a bit more broadly, so moving away from kind of chatting around um, 
open source particularly. But um, looking at how you apply data analytics to cybersecurity, where are you seeing the areas that you can really make the biggest inroads? In cybersecurity, there are many types of data sets that we can employ. So, for instance, uh, I'll talk to you about some of the problems that we've worked on in the, the past. One is understanding cyber threats to our organizations. Y you know, mostly what happens today is that something egregious is detected. We find that our IP has been exfiltrated. We find that our perimeters have been encroached. We, we find that there are bad, bad actors that perform malicious damage to our um, corporate data sets and so on. And we then try to discover how did those actors get in? What did they see? What did they touch? What did they damage? What did they take? And this all happens after this egregious event. Exactly. Now, that's great for a CISO to try to discover, but what we would like to do is get out in front of the problem. We want to be able to detect these types of activities before an egregious event happens. So rather than forensic analysis of our data sets, where we would like to go is preventative analysis to be able to have situational awareness and the types of streaming analytics in near real time that tell us that there is an activity about to happen so that we can defend against it and push those packets out of our networks, prevent them from coming in before those egregious events happen. But again, so, well, what are your common kind of use cases that you're focusing on? If you're preventative, what are you looking for? We're looking for malicious actors, ones that may come in and sit on our networks for an extended amount of time. For instance, advanced persistent threat, APT, or other types of actors that will burrow in deep into our networks, hop around our networks, and lay in wait until they can touch and exfiltrate data. We don't want them there in the first place, and what we try to do is build tools where we can detect those penetrations and also give attribution to where they're coming from and be able to defend against those. And also to do it not with the old methods that they've been able to attack our networks on, but to be able to protect against methods that we may not have seen yet. So we're trying to protect against behaviors where we may not know what, what that behavior looks like. Okay. Now that, that, very interesting. I'm very pro, we call it going left of the boom. So stopping preventative, stopping it before the boom happens. Right, right. And that's right. So in terms of advice for organizations who are looking to use data analytics to improve their cybersecurity postures, what kind of recommendations can you make? So first I would look at the best practices of security and privacy within organizations. And that goes down to training individuals. Often the weakest link in many organizations are us, the, the humans. Our <laughs> workforces, I, I'm even guilty of getting an email and clicking on a link too fast before understanding where that link is coming from. And today spoofing and phishing so emails. Good are just, they're terrifyingly good. In fact, right. with the advent of chat GPT and other la large language models, they are written and more sophisticated than ever. So we have to get better at automatically marking external emails on marking suspicious links and training ourselves as humans not to just quickly <laughs> click on, on the first thing we, we see in front of us. Exactly. exactly, what's really interesting about that is previously, depending on language, there were lots and lots of um, spam emails and spoof emails and those sorts of things going out there. Now with the addition of the AI tools, um, the level of spamming like in other languages like Arabic and things like that has gone through the roof. Like it's in the last few months. So, cause that's right. Have that problem. Now they do. 
<laughs> so just as they're getting more capable, we need better tools to detect AI generated messages and better tools to detect the, these types of, of attacks clearly. So can I can I ask in terms of like what should organizations be concerned about around this area? Like what in terms of their posture, in terms of AI and that sort of things, what should they be concerned about? That's a great question. I think what AI gives are methods for the attackers to evolve much faster than before in the types of attacks that they have. Rather than having to have individuals carefully craft single attacks against weak points in the organization, a network, an individual, now they can have a massive attack across every surface, uh, every part of the surface of the organization, every individual. And it's with that scale that now we have to also escalate our defenses and we have to be much better at recognizing that it's not just one directed email coming in, but now we have 10,000 directed emails coming in and we have to be able to protect against this higher rate, this higher onslaught of uh, potential vulnerabilities within the organization. So I think it's that scale and that detection where we're going to have to increase our ability to, to look at things that look really, really innocuous, but maybe a Trojan horse or a very sophisticated way for an attacker to gain our credentials. So in terms of your predictions around this and where things are going, because things are changing very rapidly, what do you actually predict for the future of data analytics in short, medium, long term? You know, how do you think it can be used to kind of enhance or take away either either side? But where are you seeing the future going? I think data analytics is off to a great start. This is going to be an area with rapid growth. We already saw the, the boom of generative AI and with ChatGPT emerging last November, December publicly really changed the way we think about our workforce. It changes the way we think about hiring. It changes our cybersecurity posture. It changes our risk profile. And I think we're going to continue to see data science evolving rapidly, like a Cambrian explosion of new ideas, algorithms, techniques that were really at, at the start of several years of this rapid change. So we're gonna to have to hold on, we're gonna to have to enjoy this ride and know that we're in a time of great transition and turbulence when it comes to data science and AI. Absolutely. But I, I think this is like the new internet, if you know what I mean, because when the internet came out, it was created for particular reasons. They thought it would be very academic and that sort of thing. And how it ended up being used was something very different. <laughs> And I think AI will probably run that path as well. Correct. We are certainly in the hype stage of AI and generative AI right now. And I think comfortably in the next couple of years, we're going to see where generative AI has some incredible uses, but also we're going to see some places where it has incredible failures. And we've already seen some, for instance, in the legal system as chat GPT makes up references in <laughs> cases argued to the Supreme Court and as um, individuals get uh, caught cheating on writings that use right. chat GPT that again takes liberty, liberty with, with the truth. These types of hallucinations, the bias within the results that we're getting today, the data pollution that can occur within training sets, these are areas where we need to be aware and understand and always push towards AI that is explainable, that is fair, that is equitable. And that's going to be a constant challenge to figure out how to do that and how to give these detailed explanations for how we arrived at the results that we're seeing out of generative AI. So in, in the work that you do, the, well, we'll go on to the positives, but I'm continuing on the negative side just at the moment. Um, in terms of data poisoning or the poisoning of data sets in order to like flipping labels, doing all that kind of thing, how much are you seeing of that happening today? Oh, that, 
sorry, um, that is certainly happening today. And as we see such a profound effect on businesses and competition, that it is just natural to find those types of attacks taking place. For instance, um, there may be competitors, whether it's companies within a particular sector, or even if it's uh, countries, nation states, we see this type of attack that is very hard to detect, but can have profound effect on our cybersecurity and our, our defenses, whether it's national security or organizational defense. Are you able to provide any examples of uh, like data poisoning attacks that you're aware of. I, I was aware of um, the Google anti-spam where, where the data set was poisoned and therefore spammers were able to send out um, undetected emails that were definitely spam emails because they had actually changed the labeling in the data set or polluted it to make it more noisy that they just weren't getting stopped. Well, one area that, that I've seen um, is in self-driving cars that use a lot of AI to be able to detect from their sensors what's around them. And there have been cases of stickers being placed on, for instance, stop signs or other street signs that cause the AI to mistake a stop sign for, say, a green traffic light. And so we have to be very careful in these technologies because they can have real world consequences yeah and affect all of us. So that's an area where we're going to see, as we've uh, witnessed before, malicious acts to try to taint the learning in these data sets. So is there any way, like in the work that you're doing, that you look at how you can protect against that? Yes, so one area is to include more explainability within our AI systems. And I tend to think that we need to include both machine learning tools along with knowledge graphs and real world data to really support that explainability behind the answers that we get out of AI. And there may be other features that get incorporated into our neural nets to be able to give rational explanations that a human, that a lay person can understand as to how it arrived at that decision. And I think that will go a long way to try to understand how models have been tweaked and how they've been changed that could have disastrous effects or, you know, also there are models that are tweaked to try to make them more fair. I just saw, as you probably did at uh, DEF CON, uh, the, this meeting where there's a hack, hacking or trying to abuse ChatGPT to get it to say things that are a little bit controversial or incorrect. <laughs> and these are very useful for having a nice press release. Here's the okay. bad things it did, but also for OpenAI to go back and try to tweak their models to prevent some of these poor outcomes from happening. So I think, again, we're in the very early stages and we're going to see more robust testing, tools, feedback to try to better train and guide these models as they give us inference to our most important problems that, that we ask of it. Yeah. It's, um, I always have, I'm always interested in the regulation aspects, right? It's how, how do you regulate the unknown, basically? <laughs> and particularly with AI, when we don't know all the applications to come, but it's all driven by data, right? I mean, how do you regulate that in a meaningful way? That's right, and, and that's a very hard challenge. As you know, leaders in the community have come together to call for first a moratorium to understand the regulation. And these technologies are also being used in highly regulated industries, such as healthcare and the financial sector. And these are areas where we really do need to understand how to regulate them. And this will be an ongoing conversation. It's very hard to regulate technologies where we're not even aware of the full extent of the capabilities of these technologies. And also we have to have conversations among individuals in this country and around the world 
on what is it that we allow for our data, to how, how it should be used now or in the future. There may be uses decades from now from data generated today that aren't even imaginable. And we have to understand how we're going to regulate today those potential uses five, 10 years down, down the line. Yeah. So is self-regulation an option here? I mean, we've, we've talked about self-regulation in other areas of technology and, and how that went. Um, I saw some article, I think Google CEO had... Um, made an AI pact with the EU about voluntary behavioral standards prior to them implementing the EU AI Act. And I, I just thought that was an interesting perspective as we kind of relook at that whole process and how it could work. That's right. But I, I think self-regulation for AI right now is going to be very challenging. Many companies are moving forward with AI in leaps and bounds. And one of the reasons is it's an existential threat. If their competitors are doing it and they're not, then exactly. it will be, uh, it could be the end of, of their company. Right. I've had conversations with many CISOs who are looking at how to mitigate the risks while allowing the company to experiment exactly. and move forward, understanding that the regulations may be put into place in the future and how to do things that will remain keep the company competitive while not creating that much of a risk um, in the future. But it, it's a, a challenge that we have and never before in the technology sense have we seen such a dramatic change in such a short period of time. So yes. I, I believe that the next two, three years will be a time where we come to terms with what is going to be the, the right best practices, what is the right amount of regulation by government, what's the right types of self-regulation as we weather, uh, not necessarily a, a storm, but this dramatic change and new excitement that we see from these new AI models. Absolutely. So can we jump on to the positives on AI? <laughs> Let's see the positives now. Um, okay. So AI-enabled data analytics, like how are these technologies helping teams to understand more data and faster, more efficiently? Those sorts of things. Like what are examples where it's going to change how we can absorb and understand and use data? And can we put this into a little bit of context too, by the way? I was with the... Latest data creation for 2023, I believe, is 120 zettabytes, which is like a 23 zettabyte increase over the year before, which is like what, um, 120 plus like 21 zeros. I mean, it's mind blowing how much data there is. So wait, I just want to put that in context with that huge question that is, Audra. <laughs> <laughs> right. The amount of, of data is just unfathomable and it's growing every single year. And that makes it very challenging for us to keep on top of tools that can manage these types of massive data sets. One area that I am working on is democratizing data science at this large scale, creating open source tools where anyone, any organization, anywhere around the world can readily ingest and process massive data sets beyond the capabilities of enterprise and commercial tools. So imagine you have tens or a hundred terabytes today would be a large size. It's not yet zettabytes, but we, we do have hundreds of terabytes that you'd like to be able to pick up, manipulate, process by analysts who speak in Python, the lingua de franca of data scientists, and maybe they know how to use NumPy and Pandas and Network X for graph analytics, but these data sizes would just overwhelm their tools. They would never finish loading in their data set, yet asking any questions about their data. So I'm building out, along with, with partners in Department of Defense, a system open source called Arcuda, which is the Greek word for bear, and this system is in GitHub. You can find it at the Bears R Us repository in GitHub. <laughs> We've been working on this the last several years to allow individuals and organizations to be able to ingest and basically replace NumPy and Pandas and NetworkX with 
the Arcuda tools and our specialty for graph analytics in a data repository or a data toolkit called Arachne, the Greek word for spider. So with Arcuda and Arachne, we now have dozens of analysts ingesting tens of terabytes of data and being able to manipulate those data sets in near real time just as easily as they could on their, on their laptops. Wow. This um, really makes data science accessible. And we also use supercomputers and we use advanced computing techniques. We're using an open source compiler from HPE called Chapel that allows very productive coding by my research group and developers. And through our hard work, others are able to just turnkey use this solution. So we made supercomputing accessible and really democratized massive scale data analytics so that anyone anywhere has the ability to, to look at these great data sets that we often find in cybersecurity problems. Wow, that, that, I would agree. <laughs> that, that is super wow. But the question is, so what you're enabling does it enable people to actually understand the outcomes? Is it step by step? Because because at the moment people have like adopted things like Chat GPT, but a lot of people don't understand what's under the bonnet or you know right. under the hood, so to speak, in American. <laughs> they don't know what the engine is. <laughs> that that's right. So we use Python or their Jupyter notebook as their productivity portal. And just as easily as they'd write a few lines in Python, maybe using NumPy and Pandas to ask their questions of their data or to get results, they can do that just as easily in their, their same notebook, but connected to Arcuda, the software framework that's open source that we built out. So any data scientist who's very comfortable in in their current working situation now can use a supercomputer with Arcuda and Arachne. The challenge is not on them for that heroic programming. That's really for us to give them the illusion that they're running on their desktop when the massive data set is really ingested on a backend supercomputer and we use right new technology to be able to route their queries to this backend supercomputer. We do all the heavy lifting for them, uh, paralyzing the approaches, being able to target supercomputers and massively parallel processors, GPUs, and all these types of technologies so that the results come back to them on their laptop and they don't have to see everything that's happening in the cloud and on the back end where we're doing that that very heavy lifting for them. That seems like a really great means of information sharing too, right? I mean, as things kind of come up, then you're able to share that information a little more broadly and help inform others, right? What to look out for, this thing is emerging, all, all of that too, yes? That's right. People can be good citizens. So as they detect vulnerabilities and as they see exploits, certainly now they can share those results. And it's no longer left to the big Fortune 100 companies that have massive cybersecurity teams and large budgets and specialized systems. Now, anywhere around anyone around the world at any time can ingest all of their system logs, can ingest all of their uh, information, their, their data, and be able to run on this software framework to be able to ask the same types of queries and questions as large enterprise can do. Can that actually be run in kind of a walled garden manner so that the data that you're uploading, you know, may, you may not want to share wider? <laughs> amongst the community or, you know, hash it or do something so it's anonymized? That's a great question, Audra. Certainly you wouldn't want to share all of your corporate and, and private data with the world. Absolutely. The, the toolkits, the Chapel compiler from HPE is open source. It's on GitHub. And all of the software for Arcuda and Arachne are also open source on GitHub. So any organization can download it and run it in their corporate environment on-prem or in the cloud. And they're free to encapsulate it in their own uh, security at their own wall gardens, or they can run it publicly if they want. Excellent. Now that, that 
makes it very accessible. And then that actually provides the protection that you need on top of it for your data. That's fantastic. In fact, we built it with open source in mind so that others could use this in any way that they would like and also contribute as well new analytic routines, new performance optimizations, new algorithms. But by doing it in the open source, it becomes a trusted toolkit. Anyone can view the source code and understand what it's doing. And we make it very accessible because our goal is really to democratize the ability to analyze these massive data sets. We think for cybersecurity to really take hold in the next few decades, everyone needs to be able to understand these tools and tooling. And as we have data created in every industry, in every sector, across every part of the world, from the edge to the cloud, we're going to need tools that we can deploy to really protect data. And as you know, data is the new air, data is the new (laughs) oil. We're going to have to protect everything everywhere. Yes, exactly. Just for out of curiosity, how long does it take to build something like this, David? I mean, it sounds like a massive undertaking, but, you know, so beneficial to so many in providing this really invaluable resource. But, I mean, is this like six months, a year, five years? I mean, how long have you been working on this? We've been working on this since about 2019, 2020. So mm-hmm. it's a labor of love that the last few years. And we have support from the National Science Foundation to... Fantastic. Uh, build out this this uh, software framework in the last couple of years. And the project is joint with Department of Defense and the initial vision and contributions did come from collaborations with the DOD. And I wanna call out one of the visionaries that I worked with in creating the system, Mike Merrill. Sadly, he passed away last year, about a year ago in November. And I really want to recognize him and his vision for building the the system to make these data science tools available. In fact, um, Mike had a brief illness and up through his his last days was really trying to make sure that Arcuda had a foothold, that we were carrying on this vision that we created together to continue developing these tools. So in Mike's memory and uh, oh, for his passion, I, I really feel personally that, you know, we, we, Mike and I developed many tools together over decades in, in the past, and this was really something that we wanted to, to carry on and be a lasting legacy to, to his memory. And this is an amazing oh, legacy to be leaving behind for the whole world. That's incredible. Yeah, truly. Yeah, it's because it's these, these kind of resources, right, that can be game changers for so many organizations that just wouldn't have access, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do any of this and, and would just kind of be finding their way through. So that's, that's fantastic. Wow. Right. So we're very glad to be able to continue developing these tools. And again, we can't do it alone. There right. are contributors to the project. There's a team that we work with and continue to build out these tools. And also I should give a shout out to HPE, they acquired the supercomputing company Cray, where the Chapel mm-hmm. compiler first formed and was developed under a DARPA program about 20 years ago to make mm-hmm. these types of activities more productive. And the team at HPE, led by Michelle Stout, has been really fantastic on making Chapel the best that we can achieve in terms of performance and, and capability. Wow, that's exciting. I Don't you just love technology? <laughs> So, so one one last question for me. Mm-hmm. Um, considering where the world was when you started working in this kind of area, looking at machine learning and AI and that sort of things, how much has interest gone up in the last year in your career? Wow. It's like, here, have our money. That, build stuff. Right? <laughs> exactly. That, that's a fantastic question. So, In 2019, I moved from Georgia Tech, where I founded the School of Computational Science and Engineering, to New Jersey Institute of Technology because I wanted to be in the center of where data was happening in the New York City, Newark, New Jersey metropolitan region. It's a hub for healthcare, for finance, for transportation, for entertainment, for security, and all of these areas. And I founded the Institute for Data Science at NGIT. 
And this was an activity that brought together centers in cybersecurity, in big data, in medical informatics, in fintech, and other areas. Quite an exciting area. And then in the fall of 2021, I co-founded a department of data science at NGIT and new academic degree, degree programs so that we now have a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in data Wonderful. science. We thought that this would grow by a few students per year, that this was an exciting yeah. growth area, and it's really phenomenal. We are just increasing the enrollments at our university. This fall, the university is growing while many other universities are shrinking. And a big chunk of that growth is in data science. Okay. Our programs are being sought after left and right. The Wall Street Journal just named NGIT the number two public school in terms wow. of uh, their ranking system. and. We are really quite excited because data science is really at the core of many sectors, many areas, and it's a, a growth. Right now, we are seeing many students demanding courses in data science, whether they're a data science major or whether they're an architect or a chemist or come right. from any other area. We see data science as really being critical to that education and that thought process. So in the last six months, that's increased by giving it jet fuel right behind it. And with the ad advent of chat GPT and the popularization of large language models, we see no end in sight for not only the, the demand, but the need for those who understand data science. It's the most needed job in this region. There are just thousands upon thousands of jobs open for those who know data science and also cybersecurity. So we're really glad to be at the nexus of training the next generation of, of our workforce. So thank That's you. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. So how did you get into this? This is also one of our favorite questions. Like, how did you get your start on this path, David? Oh, uh, that, that's a great question. So I've always been interested in some of the most capable computing technologies. Back when I was three, probably 1972, was the first time I ever touched a computer. And wow. we used to have, <laughs> you know, a, a terminal at, at home, a 110 baud acoustic modem. And I, I was able to learn to type and transform my dad's rap for programming on car programming cards but between mainframe computers and then I really got interested in parallel computing and high perform performance computing technologies mm -hmm. through the early 1980s and my interest in graph algorithms grew from that and over time mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to develop tools that would help our nation work in national security and be able to really look at some of the most pressing grand challenge grand challenges that we have in this world and solve those real world problems right. many of them included massive data sets where we needed supercomputers and parallel computers right. for the just the large size of the problem and also because often we need solutions in near real time we want to understand what's happening before, as I mentioned earlier, something yeah. that we want to know that there's a bomb here before it goes off yeah. or to be able to predict today's weather and not take 30 days to predict <laughs> what, what's going to happen this afternoon. <laughs> and so these really converged. And my, my passion for the last several decades has been in trying to solve cybersecurity problems, problems with our uh, population health and human genomics, problems related to um, software development and, and protecting our, our software supply chain, problems related to cancer genomics, problems re related to transportation and living within sustainable urban environments, and also with the ex existential threat of climate change. And so these are all areas that require very similar types of techniques. Yeah. Wow. That's exciting. It's kind of like, you know, you're only limited by your imagination and what you can accomplish with data science in a way. That's exciting. That's right. And I always encourage students to start playing around with tools and look at problems that excite them. 
Today, for instance, one of my undergraduates that I mentor, she is very passionate about data science and just mentioned to me that she wants to work in areas related to machine, sorry, areas related to marine science and oceanography and have just reached out to look for interesting problems where maybe she'll be able to solve the next big problem in marine science using her her skills that she's learned in data science. And that's really what makes me happy, seeing students who put their passions together and solve important problems for our planet. Wow, that's exciting. I love to think about this next generation and, you know, with their access to technology and, you know, kind of these opportunities that are in front of them today and what they're going to be able to do with that. And uh, it's, I look forward to the next 20 years. I think it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. Oh, it's going to be a fun, fun ride. And I look forward to it as well. Awesome. Well, Dr. David Bader, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been such a fun conversation. Well, great to talk with you, Rachel and Audra. Really enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. So to all of our listeners, thanks again for joining us this week. Another amazing guest. And uh, don't forget to subscribe because you can get a fresh episode every Tuesday right to your inbox. So until next time, everyone, stay safe. Thanks for joining us for the To The Point Cybersecurity Podcast brought to you by Forcepoint. For more information and show notes from today's episode, please visit forcepoint.com slash govpodcast. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. 